irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Peace Fund Radio with Ethan Denmeyer and Adrian Paul. Right here on LA Talk Radio. And yes, we're here. Just we in are. time. Yes, Just in are. time you this made morning. It. Yeah, I made it. Oh, it was uh is it and, and there's John Bailey in the background jumping in early. I did. I had this whole bit ready where I was gonna pretend to be you. It was gonna be awesome. You were gonna pretend to be me. I, I, I'd love to hear that, please. Actually, <laughs> can, can, let's, let me just hear John Bailey. This is John Bailey, ladies Good and gentlemen. Good morning, pretending. this is Adrian Paul. Coming, let me hear it again. Let me uh, hear it again, John. Me, uh, Good uh, morning, this is Adrian Paul. No, did, did that work for you? Did that work for it you? You know, it, it kind of works if like a trash truck is driving by the <laughs> studio. You can kind of be faked into it for a split second, but if you really listen, it's it's clearly John Beerley, who's got a very distinct voice of his own, and and should not try to pretend to be other people. <laughs> John, just be who you are, John. Very yeah. kind. He is who he is, and aren't we glad? Yes, we are glad because he brings us all the information, and you will bring us some more today. I'm pretty sure. Um, yes. Yes, John. Of course, you are. We'll talk about that very shortly. Um, how was everybody's week? It's been a very busy week on my end. Busy week. How about you guys? Too. Yeah, very busy. How is it already March? I just uh, don't understand. I don't get it. You're shot by so quickly. Yeah, it's I don't. Insane. Yeah, I know. It's just it's it's whew, wow. It's going to be April soon too. <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> yeah, yes, before it will. you know it. Uh, I'm going to. Adrian, you had a busy morning. Yeah, I did actually. I was uh, I was off at uh, Roosevelt Elementary School in Linwood. Uh, starting um, Kimberly Moore had asked me to go over there to start the uh, uh, or to participate in the Read Across America program that they they were having there this morning. They still are having it, I think, until about ten thirty. Actually, they probably stopped now. Um, but we also launched the uh, Peace Funds Interactive Storytelling Program, and I I had a group of sixth graders in uh, Mr. Reyes's class. You guys out there were fabulous. If you listened to it, I told you to listen this morning. I'd I'd mention you this morning. Uh, Mr. Reyes's class. Mr. Reyes's class. Yes. Awesome. Uh, and um, you know, it was it was um, it was a fun morning watching everybody get involved. You know, interactive storytelling is a is a fun way. I took a book that wasn't necessary for sixth graders, but then we we read it out, and uh, the kids got up and acted out the parts. They acted out the the skunk, the rabbit, the bear, the the pelican, the the, the and then they made up voices and stuff, and they really got into it. I thought, and uh, we had a great time this morning. It was it was only for about well, probably about half an hour, forty minutes. But uh, it could have gone on longer. We were having a lot of fun, but I had to go jump back and come back to Peace Fun Radio. Yes. One's so, job is never done. Yes, indeed. But, but uh, that's cool. You had a chance to experience that. Well, the thing is, you know, we did interactive storytelling a long time ago uh, at the Peace Fund, and that was part of the School Makes a Difference program. And mm-hmm. uh, now that we have a lot of books that we're, um, we're going to be uh, utilizing to give away to kids in schools, we're going to launch the program again. And we have, uh, we've got people in place, and we're... We've been talking to different schools regarding it, and uh, we'll be launching that pretty soon, hopefully, um, once we uh, we iron out a couple of the details. But um, it was great to see that the program still worked. You know, I mean, you got kids in school that that I mean, these well, are just ten kids year olds. In school at times is inspiring. well, kids in school, kids in school at times, exactly, yeah. yeah. But it was, you know, there's a whole mixture of of kids in the school, and uh, you know, I walked in, they didn't know who I was. I mean, I had no idea who I was. I said to them, Look, "Listen, guys, my show." And they said, "What show was that?" I said, "It's called The Highlander." The what? Did they cut off heads? I said, "Yeah, that was." That was it. Yes, that it was went it. exact. I don't know why they went directly to that, uh, but I was like, "Yeah, that was it." Um, you know, but they were. Uh, they were very enthusiastic. Eventually, you know, as, as it's, it's always the way, and I've always found this with a school, uh, with an in, interactive uh, storytelling program. There are some kids that want to get up immediately, and then the other ones just kind of figure out whether or not you know this is going to be fun or not. And then you know, after that, I had a bunch of them getting involved in it, and some that didn't, but they were still having fun. I asked them at the end, "Was it fun to do?" And they said, "Yes." I said, "Was it fun to watch?" And I said, "Yes." And I said, "The important thing is." The books will give you the computer skills as well because you've got to have that to actually be able to read the, the computer, the laptops and the, and the tablets and all that stuff that you guys are so into these days. But it's so important to actually have that as, as a tool. So reading is a very important tool and also it allows you to express yourselves, and which they did this morning. They, they were having fun. They were putting on voices, making up characters. It was a lot of fun. 
So, so they that's, make, they do like a make believe thing. Yeah, it's it's you know they, it's they, like theater. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, you take the kids out and you say, okay, I've got Mrs. Beasley, uh, the rat, and uh, Tim and Matt, and okay, who wants to play Matt? Who wants to play Mr. Beasley? How often do you do this? Um, well, I did this of the interactive storytelling program, and now this is where I'm relaunching it again. It's so much fun for the person you doing be YouTubing it. YouTubing this. It, well, unfortunately, I could, I didn't have time uh, to. No, but to, next one you should actually plan on filming it. Well, we will do. We will do because what it, a good it, idea. it's such an easy way to get kids interacting with the books yeah. because once they have the books and we give them the books then because the, the program is going to do that it's going to give the kids the books they will read the books much more avidly because they're involved they're invest, uh, invested in them and I think that's really something that I think is really fun to watch well it's good it creates a sense of creativity for the kids a sense of community for the kids and both of those things are so important for kids that age yeah I mean they're, they're in that uh they're in that, uh, um, what should we call it, um, uh, uh, stage where what, it could go one way or another. You know, they mm-hmm. could lose total interest in school or they could be really involved in it and it, it improves their grades and improves their future. Because as we spoke before, most of our prison systems are full of people who cannot read. And they cannot read, they cannot do simple jobs that would give them a future of some sort. So, you know, with that... It's uh, it, it's very important to sort of um, to, to to make sure that these kids can actually have a, have those tools to be able to read. I mean, it's it, it's sad really that uh, you know we have to go through that, but um, you know it, it's part of our society. I mean, not a lot is done with with um, you know um, with the kids that um, that uh, need those tools. And so I think you know it's a it's a very important part of our our program as as the peace fund and everybody else's program to actually do these um uh, these programs that uh, allow them to give them the tools to do give them a future in a sense right and that's really the the the, the, the important part um anyway guys that was my morning <laughs> which was a lot of fun it was it was uh fabulous. it sounds like a great morning yeah it was, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it, it was it was a lot of fun i mean i drove for an hour and a half i had to do the traffic this morning in la was just unbelievable yeah. um but uh you know uh, it was well worth the drive and it was well worth seeing that this program really has a great you know it's got a great footing to really work in a you lot of schools you have to do that at the ninth street school where they bust in the homeless kids from the mission yeah well th- yes. this is we will be ta- we will be talking about that we're looking at the books the type of books that we have that would be a great way to do it i think i think all you of these could schools really use it yeah, you know, to get, every cool school could probably use it. Could, well, you know, the idea is to, to to talk to my celebrity friends to come down for an hour, like I did this morning. Mm-hmm. Very simple. It's very gratifying, actually, because when you can have fun with the kids, I think that's the important thing. As a, I want to say, as a teacher, but as a as as the person leading the class, is to really have fun and engage with the kids and, and find the kid in you. You know, right. the, you, you don't have to follow the text in the book. You can make th- things up. You know, in the middle of it, I was like, "So, uh, who's who's read books before? You guys read books? Do you like reading? You know, and you start engaging them that way instead of just, okay, here's a book. We're going to read it, and do, you just got to get involved in it. And suddenly, you find that you've you, you've like opened up in the morning. You've you've kind of it helps you as well. So when is the next one? Uh, well, well, that's what we're working out right now. We're going to be, you know, we we have a, a, a head of the program, and I'm talking to Renee Nezoda tomorrow regarding all the books. I'm talking to, to Beverly Shahara later today regarding the uh, structure, mm-hmm. um, and um, you know, so we'll 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 be pushing this out hopefully in the next next month. That would be my my wish, and then to do one. Uh, every month and then once a, once every two weeks and then it, uh, once a week once we get the the ball rolling because obviously there are slight logistics involved when you when you're dealing with getting books to schools and making sure the right schools are involved and the right. celebrities get there and all, all that stuff so um so yes yeah, it's a uh, it was a, it was a fun program this morning so it's, it sounds like a great time yeah it was very proud of you well listen um Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we started with last week, which is helping the chronically and terminally ill children. Uh, we talked last week with helping children cope with hospital stays. Um, our guest in the studio was Jess Rabbit, who talked about Tears Hope and how the charity works to create memory moments that include uh, joyful experiences, gifts, and support for children and their families who are fighting serious illnesses and forced to spend time in hospital. Mm-hmm. Now, I know they have a they have a poker tournament coming up. You can look up Tia's Hope Poker Tournament online. Uh, we'll have that on our site later on today as well. And yeah, Tia's Hope dot org. That's it. Tia's Hope dot org. Right there. And uh, today we're going to continue this discussion with other programs that can benefit these children. 
Um, wishes, simple thing. A wish is much more than just a nice thing that you can think about. Um, it reaches and extends far beyond a single event or a moment in time. In fact, this morning speaking to Kimberly Moore, she said some of the kids in the school we had were on her Adopt a Letter program where they sent in wishes for Christmas that they could get that they wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be able to afford uh, with their with their with their um, economic uh, uh, situation, so wish kids, parents, medical professionals, volunteers, and others say that wish experiences can change the lives of everyone involved forever. Programs that help grant wishes to young and seriously ill children aim to give children some kind of happiness during a hard time. Even though these wishes can't reverse the di diagnosis for these children, a new study is reporting that granting the wishes could still benefit the children and their families. We talked about that last week, about how you know a kid that's suddenly inspired by something that is um, uh, granted them, like um, I told you my electrician last week, You know, he was, his, I said to him, go to the, the, the Kings game, take your kid and see the Kings, they're big hockey fans, and they got a great experience. That's a memory for them. It's not only a memory for the child, it's a memory for the entire family because the entire family's involved when it, or affected when a kid goes to school, when a kid goes to hospital. Yeah, we also had uh, last week our hero of the week, Jen Rubino, who called in from uh, cardsforhospitalizedkids.com. She has had over 20 major surgeries, very painful surgeries that were followed by very painful and difficult physical therapies. And, you know, she received a card while she was in the hospital that just, you know, really, really made her day and brightened her day. And since then, she sent almost, her organization has sent more than 80,000 cards to hospitalized children across the United States as a way to cheer them up and let them know that they're not alone. It's fantastic. You know, I think it's really interesting because a simple thing like a card, how long does it take you to make or, or write a card? I mean, we don't do it so much anymore. We send mm -hmm. emails, cards, and all that stuff. But to make a little card, write it out, and put it in, a, in an envelope and send it off to somebody, the, the cases of terminally ill children, the majority of parents, let's say 92% of them, but they said that receiving a wish or something of this nature allows their child to momentarily escape that the reality of that illness that they're, they're, and it enriches that experience with some hope and, and and some joy in their lives so you know i think it's uh, parents really understand this because i i don't know how it would be i mean to to watch a parent go watch their child being going through a, a terrible illness or or some um a bad period of their life it's it must be really hard because it's out of your control you know what i mean yes indeed you, you sit there and you just go i mean i look I, I was watching something yesterday this is a little off topic i was watching the immigration uh issues in europe right now and the the whole um thing that's going through germany and places like sweden now uh the swedes are becoming the minority um in germany there are some areas where uh women are raped children are raped uh, and, uh, and and children are being beaten up by other kids being brought in because of religion or, or, or some other uh, um, intent from that uh, that, that uh, society that's overtaken their their culture. And to watch my kid, uh, whose home it is, to be beaten up or or to be abused in that nature must be so horrifying that I couldn't even imagine. I tried to imagine. I'm thinking, I, was, listen, I listened to it. A seven-year-old girl was raped in the playground where her mother was right by, by there by a man. And I'm thinking, my daughter's six or six and a half, seven years old. How would I feel as a parent if that happened to me or happened to her? The same thing happens to terminally ill children when your parent has no control over that illness. It's exactly the same thing. And I think... You know these things that give something positive. That experience uh, allows a child to experience more energy, and parents not be so distracted with the illness. They're distracted on something else. And all almost all parents reported in, in, in an obvious improvement in the child's mental and emotional health when they were given something of that of that sort. I spent a lot of time in hospitals as a kid, not as a patient, but with uh, with both of my parents. My uh, father was flagging traffic for a trucking company in 1970 and was, was hit by a semi-truck, broke his back, broke both of his knees. So he's had lots of surgeries on his back, on his hands, on his knees throughout the years. Uh, we lost my mom in 2011 to uh, several chronic neur neurological and physical 
illnesses. So we were always, I just felt we were always in the hospital for, for something. And I spent a lot of time, you know, just sitting around waiting in hospitals with my parents for various surgeries over the years. And that's, they can be overwhelming places for, for a kid. And luckily I've never had to, I've never been in the hospital bed being, you know, I can't, so I can't imagine what it's like for some of these kids to have to go through that. Ethan, have you ever been in a hospital? I've been in a hospital. Yes. It sucks. Sometimes when you sit there and you can't do anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> it's worse when you're there for somebody else. Well, yeah, right. that's that's right. that's even worse. That's even. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've done that a few times, and that's not fun. But I mean, imagine not being able to move out of the hospital bed for a while. Um, it, it, it's demoralizing. Mm-hmm. So you know, there's there's the benefits on giving granting a dream to to a child are many. Parents health professionals and volunteers a wish come true empowers children with life-threatening and medical conditions to fight a little harder that illness that they're suffering from um it improves their health status correct uh, health professionals who treat wish kids including the doctors and the nurses overwhelmingly believe that the wish experience can improve a wish kid's physical health You've got parents and volunteers who observe that a wish come true makes a kid feel stronger, more energetic, more willing to comply with their difficult but vital treatment regimens, especially physical therapies and things that happen after surgeries in lots of cases. Uh, Parents and medical professionals alike also describe that the wish experience is a frequent turning point in wish kids' battles for their health. Well, the, you know, a lot of a lot of doctors fantastic. and a lot of doctors and parents actually do say that you know when a uh, a wish is granted to it, it can influence the kid's physical health as well. I mean, eighty nine percent of yeah, doctors say this. Yeah, but I'm I'm a, I'm a believer, guys. You know, to me, it's very simple. I mean, and to really sort of quantify this in in a way is imagine the movement of your finger. I mean, just everybody, just think about that for a minute. How does a finger move? It comes with a thought. It goes to a thought, to the, 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 the nerve that moves the muscle, that moves your finger eventually. That thought is a, is a thought. Though all the thoughts in your brain sometimes have a negative or positive effect on your physical health. Sometimes we wonder why our back's out, why we're tight in the shoulders. It's a lot of the time because we've been giving negative energy to ourselves, and that's part of the issue. Imagine this for children who are involved in a serious illness. They must be depressed, which actually stops their, 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 their um, uh, healing process. And imagine it the other way around. If they actually have some hope, some joy in their lives, it can change their lives entirely physically as well as mentally. So... And it, I don't know, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, you know, we as adults, you know, we get into hospital, we're like, okay, we're going to a hospital, but even us, we may have some fear. Imagine a child that's in a hospital without their parents. We talked about the parents being able to go into the hospital sometimes and check to see whether or not your hospital allows the parents to stay in that hospital. Because sometimes, I mean, you know, a five year old child or six or an eight or year old child, it's, it's a bit daunting. I mean, they're away from their family, they're in this sterile type of unit, and, um, uh, surrounded by other sick children, and it must be f- f- frightening for them. You know, I it's mean- it's it, it, it is, and, and hospitals are. It, it's difficult to get any rest in a hospital. And again, I've spent many nights at hospitals. You know, sleeping in the room with you know one of my parents who had had a surgery or or this or that. Mm. And you know, there's constantly something. You know, somebody coming in to take blood pressure, take blood, take take a reading, take a temperature. It's 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 hard. It's difficult to rest. For one thing, and that that can take a lot out of you too, which is again why I think these these wishes are so important because they you know give the kids something to to look forward to and something to to focus on that's that's positive. Well, we you know we t- I was talking last week about this fact that we we you know originally many many years ago we were a society where we when we were ill we were given quiet we were put into a, an area where we would recuperate where we would sleep some of the stuff off. Today, we're so involved in giving a shot, waking up, making sure you got your temperature, making sure you... And to me, that's kind of... It brings in a whole different um, uh, way of being. Uh, Yes, it's necessary. I think sometimes it is necessary to actually do that. But I think you also have to balance it with the love and care and... and, and, um, What's the word? Rest that your body needs to recuperate. 
you know, right. you talked about John. You talked about you know people going in and, and giving them shots every you know hour or half. You know, sometimes the body needs rest and it needs comfort and it needs love and it needs things like that to recuperate. Not just the medicine that that uh, you know we, we tend to like to pump into people. Well, it's interesting too. The one of those studies said that ninety nine percent of parents reported that the wish experience gave their child increased feelings of happiness. Ninety six percent said that the wish experience strengthened their families and you, you know these families are very strained sometimes by to the limit by the stresses of the illness you have the the worry about the illness often there are financial stresses that come with come along with extended hospital stays but many of these things can be repaired and strengthened through that shared experience of the child having having a wish fulfilled you know i, I you know i got john it's, it's it's a simple thing for me in a sense because you know there is so there is a lot of hatred in the world today there's a lot of it and you know I just hope and wish that when you are able to do something good, when somebody changes from a um, from a point of view to something that is more loving and more giving to somebody else, that it empowers them with compassion and a desire to help more people, and other people will actually help them in return. I watched that, I watched a program um, last night called um, War and Peace. It's a, a four part. It's actually part of War and Peace. And one of the characters in it could never feel compassion or love for anybody. And he, you know, he neglected it. And at the end of his life, you know, he, you know, even felt compassion to the man that wronged him, even though he was, you know, in a in, in a hospital. And he said, you know, I realize now that, you know, it should be um, uh, love and compassion is all around. Even the, the, the way the air and everything around us moves, it allows us to be more compassionate towards others. And we would have happier lives. Unfortunately, the man realized it on his deathbed. I just hope we don't realize that too late. And you know, it, when, when we're talking about volunteers going out to do things, they feel a sense of compassion and desire to help others in the community when they do these these things. They they have a renewed faith in their community in in their own lives, and they trust others more and more that there's an optimism for the future. I just hope that happens from people that are in very bad situations that only see the darkness, that they turn around and see the light in in things. Because if they don't, our entire society is going to end up in civil war in many different areas of the world, and that to me, is just not acceptable. We can stop well, it ourselves. Right, it's, and it's a seed that grows. Um, 95% of community volunteers reported that increased sense of passion felt a greater long-term commitment to philanthropy. And we hear, these, we hear this every week with our Heroes of the Week where you know a child does one thing, they have one little fundraiser, they do one little thing, and they just get that bug and they can't stop. And they just keep building and building and building and suddenly you've got... You know, kids who are between eight, twelve years old who are running their own organizations for children. Right, and it's it's fantastic. Well, I'm glad you said heroes because you know superheroes are a big thing for kids. You know, they, and for sick kids as well. I mean, there there was a there was a gentleman I've forgotten his name who actually used to dress up as Batman. He, uh, he Lenny passed, Robinson. He just died recently. He did. He 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 died in a traffic accident on his way to a hospital. Unfortunately, uh, in August of last year, he. Uh, Lenny, he was incredible. He in 2007 he sold the industrial cleaning business that he had started in high school to become a full time volunteer for hospitalized kids. Uh, he he had his he had this incredible Batman costume and he built a Batmobile and he drove around. It took him 45 minutes to get into his costume. Every time he would visit a hospital, he would lose six pounds of water weight from from the from <laughs> from how hot and sweaty the batman costume was he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of his own money on his crusade but he didn't just give the children gifts he gave them hope and strength in the face of diseases and painful tests brutal treatments difficult therapies he let the kids know that they were never alone and he reminded them that they too were superheroes for facing their illnesses with courage and spirit you know i mean just like the batman in the comics lenny robinson used his fortune to protect and inspire children and he lives on through his feats and through the lives of the hundreds upon hundreds of kids who stood up against their illnesses because Lenny Robinson's Batman came into their hospital room and sat with them and told them that they could. You know, you know what I think is really interesting, John? I think it, the fact that I brought that up, that wasn't something we discussed. But you have all the information about it. You, you remembered that very very much we spoke about that before we did. i love you're like a walking encyclopedia sometimes <laughs> because you know it's like 
oh, John, can I have the information on this? And, oh, yes, there it is. Uh, so, uh, but I think he did what he did. He, he not only touched the kids, he touched the, the parents and the people and us because for, through what he did. You know, t- today from Tampa to Pittsburgh to Chicago to Memphis, there are comic superheroes being spotted in all over the country and and fighting crime on windows now. Spider-Man, Captain America, and Batman, just to name a few, are washing windows at children's hospitals. Their mission to bring happiness to the youngest of patients. Now, in, uh, Im- images of wide-eyed children in awe of their favorite superheroes washing windows have gone viral online, prompting hospitals and window washing companies nationwide to hop on board. The superhero trend is spreading all over the country. So if you, spe- you see one, then you'll, you'll know why. In October, Spider-Man and about a dozen of his superhero friends visited kids at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. to cheer up patients and to deliver a few toys. For many, the costume club visitors provided a, a distraction from the hospital surroundings and gave those fighting serious illnesses added energy and a little bit of laughter as well. Some kids needed visits from their heroes to help them heal a visit from a superhero can transform a kid's life it can give them strength they need to get they need to get through a rough day or a painful procedure or break the monotony of a long hospitalization and these are these these visits are occurring in hospitals all over now i just want to mention something about that because you know we started something years ago when i was in the class this morning a lot of kids said, "Are you going to do another film?" Are you going to do? I said, "Yeah, I'm going to do something." Well, do one about vampires. Do one about uh, do one about uh, Godzilla. Do one about this. Do one about that. The, the 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 idea of superheroes, even though it was a comic book many years ago, that nobody even took any mention, any thought of it being some ridiculous, you know, small idea that somebody had, and then it grew and grew and grew and grew, and today. The people that, that, that follow superheroes and dress up as superheroes in some places are seen as nerds, but in some cases they're not. In some cases they're, they're there to give hope and inspiration. What is a superhero? What is a superhero to a child? What is he to you? It can be somebody that has great vision or Spider-Man that catches bad guys with his web or Batman who, who fights crime in Gotham City. I mean, that has been going on for so long and it not only inspires adults but it inspires children as well. Absolutely. The first Superman comic was in 1938, Batman in 1939, Wonder Woman in 41, I think. So, so I, it, these characters have been around for a long time. Yeah, and the point is, why are they around for that amount of time? You well, know, it's, some, it's, it's our modern mythology. It's what? Because, you know, it's our modern mythology. Right. These are our Greek myths. These are our, you know, Norse and Roman myths. I mean, these are this 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 is this is our mythology. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, you know, there's a there's a there's something actually. Um, we were talking about Batman, weren't we, Lenny? Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I think I think it's I think it's just amazing that that uh, superheroes can do this. Let's talk a little bit about, before we, we go on any further about this, let's talk about our, our own Hero of the Week, John, because I think, you know, you can, I, th- I think it's important to also highlight the, the, the heroes that are regular kids. So tell us about our Hero of the Week this week. There are. The, um, you know, today's Hero of the Week is actually our first Hero of the Week from, from Thailand, from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Her name is Yada Prukskachun. She is from uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand. She's 17 years old. As a young girl, Yada was bullied because of the flaky rashes that she constantly had from atopic dermatitis, which is a genetic disease that she'd been born with. It wasn't a terminal illness. It wasn't a disability. But it still made Yada feel like she was an outsider. The rashes had healed by the time she was 13, but she still felt the special kinship to hospitalized children. She wanted them to know that being in the hospital didn't mean that they had to be separated from the world outside or, more importantly, separated for their hopes and their dreams for the future. So on one sunny summer day when Yada had nothing else to do, she went to the hospital and she taught an impromptu dance class for, uh, for a bunch of kids in a cancer ward. Soon after, she received a video from a young girl, a young leukemia patient, who had attended Yada's dance class. This young girl told Yada how much the class had meant to her, and she implored Yada to come back to the hospital to teach another class. This girl told Yada that if she would come back, that she would wake up every child in the hospital ward and say, get up, dance, it's better than dying. 
And Yada, who had been a dancer for eight years at the time, had taken for granted how much a simple dance could change a child's perspective and bolster their confidence. So she answered the call and founded something called the Light Footsteps Initiative, which you can find at lightfootstepsinitiative.org. While Yada continued to teach dance classes incorporating moves that catered to any physical limitations, you know, she would have you know, one group, one, one dance for kids who were able to do more, other dances for children who had different physical disabilities and, and, and challenges. She used her new initiative to match hospitalized children with the mentors and the resources they needed to develop their own passions. If a child can name an interest, Yada could find that child a mentor for it. And in 2013, she launched another campaign called Empowered You to inspire hospital kids in 20 countries to create and share videos about their interests and their hobbies. Yada still works today on site at several hospitals in Thailand, but she reaches children around the world via YouTube videos and social media, all of which can be seen and shared from lightfootstepsinitiative.org. Yada says of her organization, my parents are both doctors. So growing up, I was able to see the parallels and the differences between my life and the life of the youth on the other side of the hospital chain of power. Also, I feel like hospital youth are a very overlooked demographic when it comes to empowerment. Hospital youth transcend boundaries. Yet when there are hospital-related charities, those usually focus on bringing entertainment, such as concerts or dance performances to the patients. The difference between those initiatives and this one is that we mentor and teach them how to make their own dance performances and discover confidence in themselves. After they are able to do that, they will realize that even though they're hospital patients, they still have the power to pursue what they love, whether that culminates to a dance performance or a book. So Yada Pruxkatoon, you are our Peace Fund Radio Hero of the Week. And you can find her, again, at lightfootstepsinitiative.org. Definitely go check out the website. There's a link to their Facebook page there where there are lots of videos of Yada and her volunteers leading dance classes and and other mentorship opportunities for these kids. It's amazing stuff. Yeah, you know, it, again, this is another way of kids expressing themselves or, or parents or sort of adults expressing themselves. When we do that, I mean, a lot of the time we, we end up being in a, I mean, not all of us are more in the creative world. Some of us are more into the edu- uh, um, educational or or a banking financial world. We're more drawn to that. But I still think everybody has a creative side to them that allows them to express that the human body is made up of several different aspects. It's made up of the spiritual. It's made up of the sexual. It's made up of the the intellectual. It's made up of the 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 the, the, the charitable. It's made up of everything. And and as long as we balance those things in our bodies, we will be balanced human beings. And I think being creative like this, if you take that away from a child, we've talked about many times about how in many schools they are lacking in musical equipment or the arts program that taking that away from a child and then concentrating on thesis or or structure sometimes is not as beneficial as allowing a child some outlet in some respect that allows them to be creative we have lots of other heroes of the week too who have done some really incredible things for kids along these lines we had uh, claire wineland her website is claresplacefoundation.org claire has cystic fibrosis which is very painful, causes a lot of difficulty with breathing. It's a chronic condition that attacks the lungs. Claire has all kinds of videos that she makes for kids to give them ideas for things to do during their extended hospital stays. And it's just really funny videos. She's hilarious. She's so funny. And she also has on her website, uh, Claire's Foundation, clairesplacefoundation.org, uh, an encyclopedia that she's put together for the parents and the children for what to expect in their hospital stays, how to make the most of it. Uh, we had Jen Rubino, again, from cardsforhospitalizedkids.com, who called in last week. And we had another hero of the week, Risha Shukla. Uh, since she was three years old, she battled multiple chronic diseases and health conditions. She is living right now without six of her organs. Six? She's lost six. How is that even possible? It's possible. When you, <laughs> it's, for this girl, it's possible. She's living without six organs. She's lost you know, much of her childhood to hospitalizations, lives with constant pain. She's endured numerous surgeries since she was seven. She created something called the Kids Who Care Club. You can find that at kidswhocareclub.org to educate and encourage other young sufferers of chronic conditions and their families with cards. They send care packages. They have a traveling variety show 
where they go around to hospitals and perform for, for children in who have been hospitalized for a long time, speaking engagements, web seminars, and they also uh, raise the funds to build a playroom for children at a hospital in rural India. So it's the kidswhocareclub.org. Another uh, fine example of, again, our heroes of the week who turned their own difficulties, their own pain, their own illnesses into hope and possibility for other kids who are in the same boat. Well, you, you talked a minute uh, uh, a minute ago, John, about our hero of the week, uh, Yada. Uh, there is also somebody else I, wa- I want to mention here in the uh, United States, uh, Robin Rosenberger from Seattle, who founded uh, Tiny Superheroes. Um, she's currently outfitting thousands of kids with superhero capes as they battle the forces of a disease. In 2012, she made capes just for fun. And this is where I like things. It just happens out of an idea that you have. You just never know where that idea is going to take you. But obviously, there is a reason why she did it. And, and she sent one cape to a girl with a severe skin condition, along with a few other sick kids. And now the cape closet is full with requests pouring in from almost, well, everywhere. Uh, A small hobby of making capes turned into a movement in just months. And in their first three years, with the help of supporters all over the world, they sent 9,000 capes to extraordinary kids in 50 states and 16 countries. That's awesome. Children with cancer, congenital heart defects, epilepsy, undiagnosed syndromes, rare diseases, autism, and all sorts of other tiny superhero powers have revealed their true identities through these capes. And I think that's a great way. You're empowering the kids. These superheroes, you know, it empowers it, 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 tiny superheroes. It wants to seek to empower extraordinary kids with it to who exemplify strength and determination by overcoming illness and disability. And it's a simple thing. It's a cape. How much does that cost? Uh, you know, when you're a small kid battling for your life, you need all the help and encouragement you can Absolutely. get. Yeah, but that is an awesome gesture. I mean, if you think about the ramifications of that, yeah, that is well, a. That is a big time symbolic step. Exactly. I, mean, I bet the psychology goes to eleven when you're handed a cape. Yes, exactly. So. That, I mean, that, that. I mean, as we talked earlier on, being in a hospital room. Yeah. You know, you're sent items that give you, but a cape as well is a great psychological boost. Totally. You know, I'm now a superhero. I can battle this, no problem. And all of a sudden, your brain, as we talked about before, can combat some of that physical. Uh, illness that, that you've been you've been experiencing. Mm. Oh yeah, the beauty behind it, you know, is, is it's not just about sewing a cape. I mean, it, like you said, Adrian, it, it builds on their self esteem, empowerment, um, families working together, that sense of community within hospitals. They can raise money, they raise awareness, and medical help for the kids. All all of those things come out of again this simple this simple gesture. You have this colorful cape that gives a struggling kid a reason to smile raises awareness about the rare diseases that they have, the disabilities they have, to let the world learn that there's a whole army of resilient and inspiring fighters out there and their kids. It's amazing. You know, we, we have been lucky on, at the Peace Fund. Uh, we've had several people make uh, things for us that we can disseminate. And that, now that the Peace Fund and Peace Fund Radio have become much more of a hub towards other charities and stuff, our new website, which I have been working on, yes, I, did, I swore I wouldn't mention it until we were ready for it, but uh, it's getting very close now. We've been working on it, um, and it is a, a fairly massive site because we've been in, we've been in the, this process for 17, 18 years now. So uh, obviously we've done a lot of sm- smaller things, not huge, but we will be changing that. And some of the things that I want to give out to you, you know, is the fact that you don't have to just donate money. You can donate some of your time. I was funny. I was talking to our webmaster, and I said, you know, we had one program where um, uh, Kathy Johnson, if you're listening, Kathy, um, she, you actually uh, knitted a bunch of blankets for us several years ago, and it was one of the great, one of our long, one of our our, our, our original and most uh, most dedicated. Um supporters Kathy. right and, and and i was saying you know it, it was a way you know you like to knit as you get older some people like to sit there and knit it's, it's a great therapeutic thing uh we talked about you know um how art adult art is is becoming therapeutic that therapeutic uh gesture can actually turn somebody's life around and that's what we're going to be doing on the, on the peace fund is actually putting these small little things you can do Little ideas that you can do that we will be able to disseminate to different organizations and that may be looking for something like a blanket, like a cape around the country. It's a very simple thing. So you guys can get involved in actually being able to participate 
by a simple thing that you might like to do. It might be something you're doing at home, like knit, knit a scarf, a pair of socks, you know, some blankets or whatever. That stuff, you, you'll be imagine imagine a thousand of you out there knitting one blanket. That's one thousand blankets we will be able to send to some kids that, that are in need of blankets. The simple gestures of that nature we're going to be actually putting up on our new site. I just thought I'd mention that because it, it, I think it's a, a very simple thing that we don't think about that, you know, is something that we really like to do that, you know, is is can affect other people. Yeah. Well, without a doubt, and in a positive sense, what we need to do is we need to organize that from the ground up like a presidential campaign. Don't don't tell me about presidential campaign because that's that's a whole no, other discussion. You, know, you and I have never actually talked <laughs> politics. I Let's think, not talk politics because I think it's going. We need whoa. to get like a peace fund stamp that has the peace fund address on it and everything. A peace fund like web address, and we need to get like people who's we need to start organizing people based on their passions. That'd be an interesting way of doing it. Yeah, you know, people. Some people like to paint. Some people like to knit. Some people like to build stuff. You know, we got to figure out what's what. That's a that's a good and, idea. And that's a good like idea. A field marshal kind of figure out what our logistical yeah. worth is, and then start tackling the targets. Because what, one of our portions, one of our por- uh, uh, sections on the site is how you can help. Yeah. Volunteer, donate, donate your time. But that is another way of doing it, and I think that's what I think is very interesting is Should to be you- able to empower people and and give people something that they like to do. Yeah. You know, it could be something as art. You might like to draw. But imagine taking those to hospitalized kids or, 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 or a cape to a hospitalized kid or a blanket to a kid that needs it that, that doesn't have the, the, the ability to, to, to clothe them, the homeless, stuff like that. There's so many different ways we can help and organizations now that we know that can distribute these, these things. And that's what I always thought the Peace Fund was going to be about was, you know, I, I, when I started the Peace Fund, I had no idea what direction I wanted to, right. to be. So, but protect educate aid children everywhere was very simple because i wanted it to encompass everything and over the years we've been able to sort of partner with different organizations and go into different areas we've done run our own programs we've helped other other people's programs but as we've worked as peace Fund radio has been on the air for now for three years and obviously some we're doing something right because we've got nearly two million viewers a month or downloads a month you know that we, we've got to hear that people are listening to guys this is so simple to do it's so simple to change somebody's life and by doing that it'll change your life because there are kids out there that need help for something you like to do and that's what i always think is in- interesting is something we like to do it could be a walk it could be knitting it could be painting it could be building it could be anything of those natures right. but we're going to i think we should definitely incorporate that into our new site that will launch and then gradually we will build on that and put different people in those positions and we'll be expanding the artistic cultural community at the same time exactly which i think is very important because mm-hmm. you know as we've said art music arts is important in our lives we all need that why are we, why do we still as adults go to the movies why do we want to watch movies? Whether they are horror movies or action movies or love stories or drama, whatever. We go there because we like to be taken away into a different world. We like that fantasy. Mm-hmm. You know, you talked about the, escape, the... it's very important. Yeah, well, exactly. Escapism is important. The storytellers of yesterday when we were around campfires, today are the movies or the TV shows. Whatever you, whatever you like, you know, it, it affects you and allows you to escape and now realize another world because... And it gives you empower. It empowers you sometimes. Yeah, I think it it could work on so many emotional levels. You know, it's really actually if you if you if you look at what you're putting forward on a platform sense, it's it's really kind of awe inspiring when you look at what it can it, it, look at it in depth of what it can achieve. Yeah. Well, talking of achievement, I want to give um, a little shout out to a couple of organisations making a difference uh, in the in the, uh, the lives of children that are hospitalised. Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. That's Children's Miracle Network Hospitals.org, Charity Navigator Four Star Organization. Uh, they generate funds and awareness programs in partnership with and for the benefit of member hospitals, foundations, and the children they are privileged to serve. They raise funds for more than 170 children's hospitals across North America. Countless individuals, organizations, and media partners unite with Children's Miracle Network Hospitals to help sick and injured kids in local communities. You should check, check them out because they've been around for a very long time. Since 1983, they've raised more than $5 billion. 
Here's $5 billion, most of it $1 at a time for 170 children's hospitals across the United States and Canada, which, in turn, use the money where it's needed the most. And that's one of the things we've always been talking about. Put the money where you need it most. Don't spend 62 it. children enter one of these, the Children's Miracle Network Hospital for treatment every minute. That's one child a second. 62, 62 kids. That's unbelievable. A second. One uh, child I, every second. I believe that's 1.008 children every second, if my math is correct. <laughs> <laughs> you said 62, correct? Okay. Just, uh, there, there, goes, there goes Ethan. He has just proved to us that being educating to, yeah, education in school is definitely necessary. Just wanted to prove my worth here in studio. <laughs> put that on record. Another organization uh, that we've talked about before is the Dream Factory. Dreamfactoryinc.org, a nonprofit that grants dreams to critically and chronically ill children from the ages of 3 through 18. Uh, again, they started very early in 1980. Uh, they had an all-volunteer chapter in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, and since then they've grown into the second largest children's wish-granting organization in the United States. They've granted over 25,000 dreams since its inception, all while maintaining a grassroots approach. Dream Factory continues to operate in all 38 of its local chapters with over 5,000 very dedicated volunteers. Uh, the hardworking volunteers raise funds within their own communities and then use those funds to grant the dreams of local children. Like I said, get your own supporters to do it in your own communities. I want to empower you guys out there to help your communities and help us in your communities bring things that they might need. The Dream Factory is used to grant the dreams of critically and chronically ill children. We had Dalton Sear on the show, who actually is part of this organization as well. Yes, he's, one of their, he's their national ambassador. Right, who originally brought us this, this, this information. Uh, lastly, I want to also give a shout-out to Ronald McDonald House Charities, rmhc.org, another charity navigator four-star. Uh, they, their idea is to help families stay close to their child through a network of local chapters. Something you see every day, children healing because they're surrounded by their families, which we talked about earlier on. And while the Ronald McDonald House may not be able to make the medicine taste better or erase the pain of much-needed treatment, they have helped lessen the burden of nearly 5.7 million families in 2014. And since 1974, the network of local chapters have been making children happy and healthy by keeping families together which we talked about earlier. I want to reiterate that. Keep the families together while the children are sick. It gives them a place to rest and refresh, a place that feels like home. Now, guys, um, there are a lot of Ronald McDonald houses. You can check it out. We will have all this information on our website today. And um, again, uh, this week, uh, I want to give you a reminder. John, any, any updates before we, we have to close out? Very quickly, I wanted to say that you mentioned Dalton Sear. He has uh, something going on with the Dream Factory right now that uh, is not ready to be announced, but he will be coming on the show in May for some really, a really, really exciting uh, project with the Dream Factory. Uh, he also has a, a new movie that he's in called Time Toys. His video is on his website, daltonsearcyr.com. Uh, the cast of the movie is teaming up with the anti-bullying or organization Champions Against Bullying. Bullying, And also I wanted to say that uh, if you're a parent and you have a child who's college age, go to gotta have soul, S-O-L-E dot org. One of our heroes of the week, Nicholas Lowinger, is giving away five $1,000 scholarships. The deadline to apply is March 5th. That's just a couple days away. So get there, apply for that scholarship. Follow Adrian on Twitter at AdrianPaul1. Follow Ethan at Combat Radio. And find us uh, on Twitter and Facebook as well, Peace Fund Radio and The Peace Fund, and also our website, thepeacefund.org. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Um, just as a reminder, you know, we are closing out. I want to thank all the, all the followers, uh, all the followers that uh, have uh, followed us this week and who have, uh, you know, donated to us in the past, in fact. Yes, uh, should I mention the the PFR episode sponsor? Oh, yeah, why not? We should well, do that. Well, you know, we wouldn't be able to do any good whatsoever without a show sponsor. So when you're talking about heroes, right, uh, this is your chance to step up and be a hero. Uh, for our listeners out there, if you make a donation of $250, you can dedicate an episode of your choosing to someone special, make a difference, immortalize them in radio history folklore and become, uh, you know, and, and you will get, uh, 
you will find a link to our support wall on our homepage. And if you go to peacefund.org, you'll see all the information you need to know. You can email Bev at thepeacefund.org with any questions. And then, you know, Adrian, Paul, and I will sing all kinds of songs, <laughs> do all kinds of, you know, native rain dances, clapping, and we'll have a chance to do even more good with your help. Thank you, Ethan. I will leave, leave with that. Um, and uh, thank you to all of you for the listening today. A uh, quote from an unknown uh, person My heroes don't wear capes. They don't fly or have superpowers. They can't stop speeding bullets. My heroes, they do even better stuff. They have chemicals poured into their bodies. They withstand being poked and prodded multiple times a day. They push limits to find their strength, and they do it with a smile. My heroes are the kids who fight cancer, who have no clue what is going to happen every day. This is Adrian Paul and Ethan Deadmire. We'll talk to you next week. You're listening to Peace Fund Radio with Ethan Denmeyer and Adrian Paul. Right here on LA Talk Radio.